Hello, and welcome to another Cambridge installation of Talks at Google. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome Professor Sarah Seeger, who is an astrophysicist and planetary scientist at MIT. Her research focuses on theory, computation, and data analysis of exoplanets. Her research has introduced many new ideas to the field of exoplanet characterization, including work that led to the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere. Professor Seeger also works in the space instrumentation and space missions for exoplanets, including CubeSats, as a co-investigator on the MIT-led TESS, a NASA Explorer mission to be launched in 2017, and chaired the NASA Science and Technology Definition Team for a probe class starshade and telescope system for direct imaging discovery and characterization of Earth analogs. And with that, I'd like to welcome Professor Seeger. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for coming out to my talk. The book is called Aliens. I've called my talk something else. And sometimes I like to call my talk the real search for alien life. So at the outset, I want to say I'm not looking for like little green aliens coming here. Or I don't know if anyone here believes in aliens. But the funny thing is, every time a new planet is in the news, um, people like me get emails and phone calls. I actually got this, the most recent one. Have any of you heard of the Trappist planets? About a month ago, there were these seven planets all orbiting a very cold star. I'll talk about those in a bit. And I, just, I don't pick up my phone because, you know, typically there are these calls about UFOs and things. But this one was this lady who was very serious and very nice. And she just wanted but you know, she's been to this planet. And would someone please talk to her about it? And she was not really worked up or anything. But it's incredible how the, um, you know, the whole fiction of aliens and the movies really uh, is now coming to reality, actually. Not that we're going to find them again, but we're taking a very traditional scientific approach. And so I'm here today to share with you just some of these approaches. And I'm right over at MIT, and there's an awful lot of work going on there in this field. So I'm going to walk you through what an exoplanet is, where we're at. And then I was going to tell you a bit about space telescope called Kepler and the data that it has and how we use that data. I'm going to funnel through towards how we think we're going to find signs of life. And we're all really excited about it in exoplanets. I hope it won't be disappointing to you um, when you realize what will constitute not evidence, but suggestion of the fact that there might be life out there for the future when we get there. But to start with, I just have a few simple images and videos to let you know where we're at in exoplanets. And I have a movie clip made from this Eyes on Exoplanet software. Um, I do encourage you to download this and fool around with it. And if you have um, friends who are interested or children or anyone like that, it's really fun. So this is just a video clip showing you a fake image of what we think our Milky Way galaxy looks like. But it quickly zooms into a real map of the sky. And each of these highlighted objects is a star with known planets. Um, it's showing you some of the planets in our solar system. If you look closely, it'll show you spacecraft orbiting our sun. Kepler spacecraft is actually orbiting our sun, not orbiting our Earth. And if you could zoom into part of Earth, and here it will click on the uh, west coast of North America and showing you what our spring night sky looks like. And actually, what it's showing you is all the white points are stars, and all the highlighted ones are stars with known planets. There are thousands of stars out there that we know have planets orbiting them, and we call those exoplanets. Now, you couldn't see all of these stars with your naked eye. You'd probably need binoculars or a telescope to see them, and then you wouldn't see the planet or anything. Um, and here it's showing you these constellations <coughs> overlaid. And what it will do is take us to a very special patch of the sky with thousands of stars with planets. Does anyone know what that patch of sky is? It's actually where a space telescope called Kepler um, stared at that part of the sky for four years, looking for planets. I'll get to that in a minute. In the software, you can also type in a name of a star if you happen to know one that has a planet. And it will actually zoom into that part of the sky and show you um, a schematic of the planets orbiting that star. And look at this one has five planets orbiting the star, and those are the relative spacing of the orbits. And you can click on this little menu here, and here it's showing you a zone around the star that a planet, as heated by the star, might be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Now here is where it has fine print, which I think is designed so you can't read it, but it says, hypothetical visualization of planet. Because here we get to a point we don't have any data on planets like this, except those in our own solar system. But there you go. So you can actually use this and explore, and you can click on any of these objects and see what they are. But my purpose was just to convey to you that there are, you know, in our night sky, thousands of stars. Our galaxy has billions of stars. 
and we think there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. And so, wow, I mean, there are planets out there, there have to be aliens out there somewhere. And here, I'm just here to tell you about the very nearest stars and what's going on. But before I do get started with more technical stuff, I thought I'd show you these travel posters. This says Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. <laughs> and that uh, star system I just showed you, it's a small red star, not a big yellow star like our sun. So you might imagine that if most of the energy output is coming at red wavelengths, maybe the vegetation is a different color to harvest light at a different wavelength. This one says, experience the gravity of HD 40307G, a super Earth. And here it's imagining there is a planet called HD 40307G, and we know its surface gravity. We know the mass of the planet and the size, and we can calculate the gravity. It's about one and a half times that of Earth. So just imagine you go there and you can parachute. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. So what I like to say is science fiction got some things right. Because you know, there are planets that orbit two stars. And this would be like this planet Tatooine from Star Wars, where you'll see two sunsets and two suns most of the time. So what we do here in exoplanets, though, to collect our thoughts, is we put all the known planets on one plot. And here what it's showing you is um, planet size in Earth radii. So this is one Earth size, where it says Earth on this horizontal line. And this is orbital period in days. So our Earth, we have 365 days in our year. So Earth would be somewhere over here. We don't see planets there. But what I want to impress upon you or emphasize is that this is a log-log plot. So it's showing you a vast range of sizes and orbits. And what this means, actually, is that, wow, planets come in all sizes. They actually come in all masses, all orbits. It's an incredibly random process of planet formation. And this was completely not anticipated at all by anybody, pretty much in all of science. What astronomers and planetary scientists thought was that our solar system, with Earth, um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, all in the inner part of the solar system, and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and maybe Pluto in the outer part of the solar system, that was established dogma that that's how planetary systems are. And in fact, you could have had someone like me, even though Google wasn't here 20 years ago, here in this location. You could have had um, someone like me here 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if only people had realized that other planetary systems may be very different from our own. On this plot, it's showing you that some planets, quite a lot of them, they have a period of less than one day. That means their time to get around their star, their year, for one complete orbit is less than a day. And by Kepler's third law, it tells us that planets closer to the star are moving faster. So these planets are also extremely close. They're so hot. Our Earth here, we're about 300 Kelvin. These stars, these planets are about 2,000 Kelvin. Super hot. Uh, we have other planets way on the other extreme. They're so far from the star. Um, their orbital period's like 100,000 days. So it's incredible how vast the system of planets is. By the way, can you see each of the colors is a different technique? I'm not going to be able to talk about all the ways we can find planets. Here, I just wanted to convey to you the diversity. But by the way, can you see by eye what the most common type of planet that we know of today is? If you look where like the densest points are, they're actually here. See, they're all overlapping. That actually, for now, the most common type of planet we know of is one between about one to four times the size of Earth. Actually, it's more like two to three times the size of Earth. And we have no solar system counterpart for those. So we're kind of scratching our heads here because we don't even totally understand how the planets in our solar system formed. And now we have this whole new type of planet that we don't know, know what they are. So our solar system is hard to find with any current planet finding techniques, but we still think our solar system is somewhat rare. It's not that common, actually. Although we don't know how common because we haven't found any copies yet, we can say that something like less than, 10, uh, less than about 5% of stars like our sun have a solar system like ours. And because our sun itself is not the most common type of star, the numbers drop way down. So now I'm going to move on to one of the main ways we find planets. And before I get there, I just want to give you some numbers. Because when we think about the search for aliens and the search for life, we do want to find planets that are somewhat like our own Earth. And our Earth itself, it seems so big here, right? If you imagine traveling to Europe or Australia, it seems super far away. But in fact, our Earth is just so tiny when you compare it to any other astronomical object, like our sun, for example. So for our Earth, it is 100 times um, smaller than our sun. It's also 100, I think, it's, I think that number might be wrong, but 100,000 times less massive and 10 billion times fainter than our sun. 
So if I was gonna ask you, which technique would you pursue to find another Earth? Would it be one that has to do with size, or one that has to do with mass, or one that has to do with brightness? The size is your best way, because it's the you know, best ratio of planet to star. The problem is that the planet is right next to a big, bright, massive star. And so all the ways we find planets today, almost all the ways, they're ratios, they're ways of looking at the star and uh, trying to see if a planet's there. So the way we find most planets are found today is with this method called the transit technique. Can you see the planet going in front of the star? That's supposed to be Earth size compared to a sun-sized star. But we don't see that. We don't spatially resolve stars except for our own sun. And so the bottom is showing you what we do find, or what we do see, rather. And this kind of idea was um, for planets was actually proposed in the 1950s. But look at that. So what happens is the planet goes in front of the star, and you imagine that we're taking an image of a star every few seconds or every few minutes, and just looking at that star over and over and over again. And the starlight drops when the planet goes in front of the star. And when the planet finishes going in front of the star, then the, planet, the star returns to its normal brightness. And all these little wiggles, they have to do with instrumental noise, or the star itself isn't purely constant, like our own sun has sunspots, for example. So believe it or not, this is how most exoplanets have been found today, thousands of them with this technique. And what happened was we have a special telescope. How many of you have heard of the Kepler Space Telescope? Just like here, okay, a lot of you have. Well, Kepler stared at one part of the sky for four years, and it looked at about 150,000 stars. And the main problem with Kepler, why it couldn't, it actually was looking at a field of millions of stars, but the problem was data rate. We can't, we don't have a way to downlink data, a lot of it. And Kepler is orbiting our sun, just like Earth is. It's in an Earth trailing orbit. So our Earth goes around the sun, and Kepler is also orbiting the sun. And so it's getting further and further from Earth. It's hundreds of millions of miles away right now. And by the way, just for those people who might still be around, in about 60, 60 years, um, as because Kepler is in a different orbit, so it's drifting away, it'll actually return. But it won't hit us, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> well, I thought I'd show you some data and just describe briefly how we do people do find planets with Kepler data. And what it's showing you is relative brightness. And the top plot is showing you what we call raw Kepler data. And the bottom one is showing you what we call processed Kepler data. So if you see the one on the top, I want you to look at the y-axis. You can see even um, you know, looking for small planets involves extremely precise photometry, precise measurements of brightness of the star. But what gets in their way, actually, what gets in our way, actually, is the fact that we have a lot of noise going on. Because if you take a detector, let's say you could open up your phone and shine a laser or an LED at the detector, at your camera detector, and you measured how much comes back at you. Well, over one pixel, that response, how much light that you're shining on it returns, is about it can vary by as much as 40 percent. And we also have variation between pixels. So if that telescope is not perfectly stable, if it's moving a little, then actually we get a different response. And what we're measuring about the brightness of the star isn't actually the brightness about the star. It's really just something that's happening on the detector. Also, the temperature control of the detector really matters. Now, with your phone, you're not going to notice if you take a picture in the summer or the winter. But for these um, very precise measurements at many decimal places, it actually does really matter. And so there's a bunch of things going on here, but sometimes the telescope drifts or it goes into a safe mode. There's an anomaly that happens and it stops taking data. And then when it returns, it's a slightly different temperature or it's moved slightly. And that's why you're seeing all these different um, bumps and everything. And astronomers, what they do is, I don't know if those of you who work on any you know, data analysis would find this funny or sad, but often they don't understand what's happening and why. They will do like a spline fit and just take stuff out. I always find this astonishing, actually. Ideally, you'd like to understand every physical reason about why, when your star is not varying, the data coming back to you looks crazy. Like, perhaps it's battery cycling and your detector was too close to the battery. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons, but astronomers really just take it out. And sometimes I think this prevents finding, um, finding planets. Now, on the bottom plot, you see there's a lot of gaps where the telescope wasn't observing. But do you see a planet? There's a drop in brightness as the planet goes in front of the star. And the, it's all compressed, because here you're seeing relative brightness. And at the bottom, you're seeing time, which is it should have said on here, days. So this actually is going from about 100 to 700 days. This is 600, 700 days worth of data. That's incredible. We have almost no experiments in astronomy that do this. You can see, the, you can see where it is, because there's an arrow pointing to it. And by the way, um, the way we do find planets 
is use a simple algorithm. It's really just like a box fitting method. Imagine you just have a box and you take all your data and you run through different possible periods and you phase fold your data on that period. And then you literally are just looking for a box. I mean, there's other ways to do it, but that one proved the most reliable and the most efficient. Now, one funny thing about the, that happened earlier on was the Kepler team, they just cut their period off at three days. So you know, you're choosing your algorithm and your boundaries three days to, let's say, 300 days. And they didn't find any of those one-day period planets that, because their algorithm, you know, we always say about computers is it'll do what you tell it to do, but it won't do what you're not telling it. So you really want to make sure that you can um, see all things. So if you take this data and face fold it and just show it around the transit itself, there it is. Now there's time in hours and there's relative brightness. And I just want you to look at that measured precision for a second, 0.9995. And remember I told you that Earth is 100 times smaller than our sun, but we're measuring area here because it's the drop in brightness as the planet blocks out the starlight. So that would be about a part in 10,000 to find an Earth-sized planet. It's amazing. We, if I had to ask you, do you, any of you at any time in your life, had you ever made a measurement to four decimal places? Um, unless it's the gravitational wave people, most people have not done this. <laughs> so it's incredible, breathtaking telescope in space, and there's just tons and tons of great data on it. I just wanted you to know that different planets have different transits. Their transit light curve looks different, and there's a huge amount of information buried in the light curve, and so people are busy working away to try to understand what, if the planet's on an eccentric orbit, if the planet might have moons. Some of these planets are massive and close to the star, and they literally are tidally distorting the star. You can see that in the light curve, and so there's a lot of stuff going on. And finally, as part of this introduction, I wanted to show you this plot, this bar chart, so that you could have a little more quantitative, um, just to emphasize, so that you can walk away with one of the main points I wanted to convey to you, that the most common type of planet we know of it's not a big planet like Jupiter. It's actually these planets about twice the size of Earth, which we have no solar system counterparts. This is showing you the fraction of stars with planets, and um, it's showing you a bar chart of planet size, uh, planet size relative to Earth. So down on the right, you're seeing planets that are the size of Jupiter. Jupiter is about 11 times the size of Earth, and you're seeing planets that are between one, two, three times the size of Earth that are literally 10 times more common than Jupiter-sized planets. Now, if you don't pay attention to planetary science, this just might be like, okay, here's a cool factoid. But I want to emphasize one more time that in, in planetary science, people assumed that Jupiter was the natural end product, that when a planet starts forming, it eventually gets big enough by rocks and ices colliding together, that essentially it acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner and sucks up all the, all the gas around it and uh, just finishes growing when there's no more material to accrete. It's like, Luis, we used to have a joke that's, I don't know if you find it funny here, it's like Google. You know, you, Google started and grew and grew and grew and really it dominated, nothing else could, could form. That's we saw Jupiter. So the fact that all these other planetary systems not only don't have a Jupiter, but they have these smaller planets, what happened? That, like instead of Google, you have 100 different companies all kind of like Google. So it's not what we expected. So to summarize that intro, Exoplanets are diverse, covering nearly all masses, sizes, and orbits possible, and these small planets are incredibly common. So now I'm going to move on to the so-called habitable zone. It's a kind of catchphrase. It means like the Goldilocks zone. When we search for planets, we want to find small planets that have a solid surface that might be able to host life, and we want planets of the right temperature. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. So I think some of you said when I said, have you heard of the Trappist planets? And some people said, yes, you have. Well, I'm going to show you what's behind those now. So instead of like the newspaper article just hyping it all, this is actually the Trappist planet discovery. And maybe now you have a bit more tools to, to understand what it is. It's showing you days, just normalized, I guess, at one day, 1 to 23. And this is looking at the star, Trappist-1, as a function of time. And this was taken by, not Kepler, but the Spitzer Space Telescope, an infrared telescope that's about 80 centimeters in diameter. And it's also uh, in an Earth-trailing heliocentric orbit. And again, it has gaps when the telescope wasn't observing or when it downlinked to Earth. And can you see the transits? They're all labeled for you, but look at all these drops in brightness. This is incredible. There are all these different drops, and they're all different sizes. And some of them, if you see two letters, the transit was a double transit. The two planets were transiting the star at the same time. So this is really interesting. And I also want to draw your attention to the scale here. Remember the last one, it was like four decimal places? This one drop in brightness here is only about a percent. 
And this system I wanted to tell you about because we're, the field now is doing what's easy, not what we necessarily wanted to do. We're just doing the easiest thing to do. And the particular group who found this, um, they went purposely after the very smallest stars in existence. And this cartoon here now, now there's a few things going on here, but on the left you can browse the face folded data for each planet separated on its own. And you can see there are seven planets and they're going from close to the star to further from the star where the further the planet is from the star, the slower it travels around the star and the longer the transit is on the whole. And on the right it's showing you just some schematics. This yellow thing here would be our sun. You could draw like a giant, giant circle. And this is Jupiter. And this is the star, Trappist-1. It's so small, almost the size of Jupiter. If it were any smaller or colder, it wouldn't be a star. It wouldn't be able to fuse hydrogen in the core. So remember, the planet's going in front of the star and blocking light. A smaller star, it's just easier to find planets around. So there's a lot of, uh, there's skill and luck involved in exoplanets, just like any field. But it was incredible because the team had a pilot program to look at 20 stars. And one of those 20 had this incredible planetary system. And here it's showing you that in our sun, we have our inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Jupiter has some moons. And wow, this one has all these planets. And what's so great about it is that um, there may be a chance that one of them has the right amount of energy hitting it from the star and could be really the right temperature for life. So one of the things I do is I make very complicated computer models to work through all this based on the atmosphere and the greenhouse gases and things like that. But instead of telling you that, I will let me take you on a virtual trip to one of these planets. And it's not just the TRAPPIST-1 star, but there are lots of small stars out there and way more astronomers just observing small stars for planets. So let's imagine for a moment we could transport ourselves to one of these, not the TRAPPIST ones, but some planets orbiting a slightly bigger star. And the first thing you notice is a possibility that that star would be very big on the sky. And the artist here has made it, uh, take the artist's license to make the sky a different color and to show you other planets in that same system. Well, one of the things about these planets, they're so close to the star that they're what were called tidally locked. Just like the moon shows the same face to Earth at all times, these planets um, should have interacted with their star with tides so that one day, one rotation is the same as one year, one revolution. And that's what our moon does. If you've, you know the moon, you only see the same face at all time, because the moon, it's only rotating one time for every time it orbits. And we think the same should be of these planets. So what that means, if we could go to that planet, is that the sun, that star of the sun, would be in the same place of the sky at all times. Yeah, so you could choose to go where it's always sunny. The strong horse could go where it's always night. <laughs> and the funny thing, too, is because these small stars have very low energy output, so the planet has to be very close to the star to receive the right amount of energy. And so it's orbiting the star with short periods. Like these Trappist planets have a period on the order of one day to like 10 days. So that's, um, your birthday would be every 10 days. Um, so this planet would be interesting for that reason alone. But in fact, if you think more carefully about this planet, it wouldn't be great to visit. Because these M dwarf stars have flares. They're giving off flares. Does anyone remember, I don't know if anyone remember have read about this, like in the 19, do I want to say like the late 1980s, our sun had a giant flare and it knocked out Canada's power in Quebec. And this is something astronomers actually worry about too, or not just astronomers, that um, these big bursts of energy could come and like literally destroy our power grid. Well, on this particular planet, that would be happening on a daily basis in much bigger amounts than, than what we've seen here. So if you're on that, if you visited and you don't, you could get cancer literally just from all these high um, energy particles whizzing by, you flip out your phone, the electronics will get knocked off. So. Maybe it's not such a great planet to visit after all. But I was just trying to convey to you that these small stars that are 10 to 50% the size of our sun, they're the ones that are being scoured for habitable planets now. But will we be able to recognize these planets or life on them? They're so different from our sun and what we're used to here, we're not really sure. And I just listed three for those who would read the news or notice that last summer there was one announced around Proxima Centauri b. That's our very nearest star to our sun. And the Trappist planets, there was another one mentioned more recently. So that's where we're at. And the habitable zone estimate is actually from very simple energy, bu energy budgets. So I do have one more um, topic. I have a couple more topics, but the m next sort of more meaty topic would be is on exoplanet atmospheres. Because the one thing about these so-called habitable worlds, we have no idea what they're like. 
We know that their um, size and their mass, but that's it. That's why they're colored white here. We don't know. Like in our own Earth, people are worried about parts per million of carbon dioxide, right? Remember our Earth has hit a mean of 40 million, 40 parts per million, 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. And before we started out with decades ago, like 350. Now imagine on another planet, we're not just thinking of 50 part per million more carbon dioxide, but maybe double or triple. Or we have other greenhouse gases. So we need to understand the atmosphere before we can understand whether the planet's surface could be good enough for life or whether it's too hot or too cold. So the next thing we're going to talk about is atmospheres. But before I do that, actually, I forgot to show you one thing on here. If you look at this data, can you see a flare? Look at this. It's like, it looks like the star brightened suddenly. And actually happened, you know, every few days on this star, it's getting a flare. Which maybe is not too bad, right, if you have ginormous circuit breakers on all your power grid. But other stars, like Proxima Centauri b, it's flaring like dozens of times a day, basically. So these M stars, they're just very badly behaved. They're very active, just not, not great. But I wanted you to see that in the data. That's a tiny, tiny flare there. But at visible wavelengths and ultraviolet, it would have much more energy compared to the infrared wavelengths where it's being measured. So I did want to just, I just have a few slides on this right now. But remember when we were talking about the planet going in front of the star? I wanted to convey to you the main way that we study exoplanet atmospheres today. And what's showing you on the left is a cartoon showing you a planet going in front of the star with the atmosphere highlighted, um, exaggerated. But the concept is that when the planet goes in front of the star, some of the starlight shines through the atmosphere. And believe it or not, we can pick up planet atmosphere signals in that light coming through. And we think about it for a minute, we'll observe the star on its own, and then the star during transit, and essentially subtract. It's kind of hard because we're subtracting two big numbers. And um, just all modesty for, aside for a moment, I invented this technique. <laughs> and when I worked on this at the time that I started, honestly, I don't know, I wasn't really thinking like in research, if you're lucky, you can kind of do whatever you want. That doesn't happen as you get older and have a real job. But um, I was just working on this and people honestly um, didn't understand why people worked on exoplanets because we didn't have that plot like full of so many you can barely count them. There are like maybe two or three or four new planets, and they were all in very short periods. And because everybody thought we had our solar system, no one even believed they were planets. And just sort of by kind of good fortune or just risk taking, I decided to work on exoplanets when I was at Harvard as a graduate student. And my advisor gave me this problem. He said, why don't you work on atmospheres of these planets? Because we know a lot about binary stars. There's stars that orbit each other, so just kind of take that and he gave me a code in Fortran, and I, I, couldn't use, <laughs> I couldn't use that code. It was really funny because the code was so old that um, they had to use a variable name that had to be reused over and over because they couldn't store a lot of stuff. And just it was funny the way it was done. And in stars, there's a lot of free electrons, so you use free electrons as its fixed variable. But planet atmospheres have molecules. There's no free electrons because it's colder. So in the end, I had to throw it out. I decided to program in C. And later now, I adopted Python, which feels a bit lazy, to be honest but everybody is doing that and there's a lot of packages and stuff. So I worked on the atmospheres and then when I finished graduate school, we didn't have any transiting planets, but the chance to transit um, depends on how close the planet is to the star. Just like showing, throwing darts, it's not a perfect analogy, but if you're really close to the screen, it's really easy to hit it. If you're further away, your angle gets such that it's harder. So when I started my postdoc, um, everyone kept asking me, what's the next big thing? What's the next big thing? You know, if you don't know anything, those of us who struggle with small talk, if you don't know, have a question, that's the thing you can ask someone. What's the next big thing? <laughs> so looking back, these people also all had <laughs> problems with small talk. And so I'd say, you know, transits. We have no transiting planets, but it's going to happen, right? If the chance to transit for a planet in a four-day orbit is about 10%, we have seven of these now. Like, we're not going to get to 10 and get a transit, but it's going to happen. It's more and more chance, the more we find. So I worked really hard to, this is the thing I worked on when I got out of grad school, and there it was. And a couple of years later, the observers used Hubble Space Telescope and used what I had said they should look for, and they found it. And you'd think that would be great, and that after that, um, life would be great. But people didn't think this would ever go anywhere. They're thinking, well, it's a one object, one method success. It's so hard. Even I saw a few of you smile when I say, you know, we have this atmosphere. It's so tiny. And now we want to subtract two big numbers and see the features. <laughs> no one thought it would ever go anywhere. But now it's actually one of the biggest fields. It's so big and crowded that I barely work on this part now. <laughs> <laughs> so in 
So out of all that, I'm gonna, I picked one to show you because our data is really horrible, actually. So I just picked one to show you. I kind of cherry-picked the best one, but I want to make sure that you understand the concept and walk away with it because it could happen in the summer or next year or five years. Someone might say, oh, I think I found a sign of life, and so I was just trying to prepare you um, to know what that is. So what I want you to think about for a moment is this atmosphere, and I want you to imagine that if the atmosphere is absorbing strongly, the planet looks a tiny bit bigger than if the planet had no atmosphere or at a wavelength where the planet was not absorbing at all. Okay, so think about our Earth here. Like when, on a clear day or clear night, you can see the sky. So that's like a transparent wavelength. There's nothing happening there. But if you actually could look in the infrared, we can't see the sky in the infrared for most of the infrared because we have carbon dioxide and other gases absorbing strongly. So the question, so how we try to think of this problem is we think that the planet looks bigger at a wavelength where it's absorbing and smaller at a wavelength where it's more transparent. And so here's the data that I chose to show you. And what you see here is the transit depth. So this is trying to tell you how big the planet is. Um, and the wavelength in microns, showing you um, wavelength in microns, visible wavelengths is about 0.2 to 0.8 microns, and then the near infrared is further. Now what you're supposed to see here is look at the black points, which are real data taken with the Hubble Space Telescope with their error bars. And what you're supposed to do is agree or evaluate for yourself whether or not this is different from a straight line. If this was a straight line, we'd say the planet is not changing size with wavelength and it's, no long, it's not more transparent or less more absorbing at a wavelength with respect to each other. And what the red points are, red, I mean the, model, the curves are models. They're generated with computer codes that take libraries of molecular data, ultimately generated from quantum mechanics and putting it through like an atmosphere model. And what these, this, these big bumps shown by the model are, they're water vapor. Water vapor is, even on Earth, our strongest greenhouse gas. It's extremely strongly absorbing. And that big bump you're seeing, around 1.4 microns there, that's from water vapor. So the model fit, the um, quantum mechanics tells us water is strongly absorbing there. We see that our spectrum changes there, and voila, we call this a detection of water vapor in an exoplanet atmosphere. Now you see at the shorter wavelengths, the data is not as good. It's just not really telling us much. Um, and this is kind of what we see, and this is the best data we have. I have another, I did choose one more plot to show you. Um, usually when I show this, the audience laughs. But this is the same kind of data, and it's showing you the absorption in percent, so think of that like the planet size. And the blue points are data taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you're supposed to see if you know it's different from a straight line or not. Um, the one at the bottom, not, right, that's just noise or there's, it's not different from a straight line, the one on top is, and the one in the middle is definitely as well. So that's where we're at for exoplanet atmospheres. Um, but just to leave you with one more detail, that most of these exoplanets, people are spending a lot of Hubble Space Telescope time and a lot of models working really hard. We're sort of stuck with what we have. The Hubble Space Telescope is a shared observation observatory. It has instruments that were designed for things not related to exoplanets. And we can really only look at this very narrow part in the spectrum. And most, um, most of these exoplanet atmospheres, really, we do just see a straight line. And people invoke clouds. I want you to imagine for a minute you're on a plane, and you, you know how when you go through the clouds? You can't see anything looking down. It's all that lower atmosphere is blocked. But that lower atmosphere is where all the spectral lines are forming. So we think that what's happening is that the starlight is going through the atmosphere, but actually it's not. It's hitting a cloud and not making it through. So to finish up this part about atmospheres, what we want to do in the future with new telescopes is look at atmospheres of small planets. And we want to look for signs of water vapor on small rocky worlds. And we want to look for signs of gases um, that don't belong, that might be attributed to life. Now on our own planet, all of us humans, we require oxygen to breathe. That I think everybody knows. But what people forget is that our atmosphere is composed of 20% by volume oxygen. But without life, without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, we would actually have no oxygen in our atmosphere. And so this is amazing to think about, that when I think about aliens, I like to think that there are intelligent aliens around some of those planets orbiting nearby stars, and that they're building the kind of telescopes I'm about to tell you about. And they look at our planet, and they see all this oxygen. And they know that oxygen's a highly reactive gas and that it shouldn't be there. And I really hope they're out there, you know, scratching their heads, trying to weigh in on whether or not this means there is life on Earth. So that's, our, that's overly simplified, but that actually, honestly, is where people have been thinking for a long, long time. And we're trying to do something different now, look at different molecules. And I have this um, 
illustration here showing you a sea of molecules that fills chemical space, and that if we could work through all these molecules and think about which ones you know, might have life on them, it might, might be a signature of life. It might increase our chances of being able to find and identify life on some of the planets that we're just struggling to observe. So this field is kind of in the future, but that's in a nutshell what the sort of very next milestone in exoplanets is. It's studying small planet atmospheres looking for signs of life on them. So to summarize that part, um, dozens of exoplanet atmospheres have been observed with tiny signals on orders of parts per thousand. And oxygen in a small planet atmosphere means our favorite way to find signs of life on another world. But because it's upcoming, people are generating all sorts of po um, false positive scenarios. How could oxygen be generated without it actually being from life? So this is a TBD stay tuned kind of topic. Now for the last part of my talk, I will actually just tell you a bit about the telescopes that we're going to use to study these planets. This one is the James Webb Space Telescope. Initially, it was considered like the follow-on Hubble, but it's actually quite different. It's far bigger. It's going to orbit a million and a half miles from Earth, and it's going to work in the infrared. And look how it's um, on the left is the artist's conception, which shows you the mirror, as well as this very large tennis court size solar shield. And each of those layers has a different weave, uh, woven pattern. So when energy gets absorbed, it will be re-emitted in a way that doesn't keep getting absorbed and re-emitted and hitting the telescope and heating it up. Remember what I told you before about temperature control of the detector? Well, in this case, um, the whole telescope has to operate very, very cold because it's working at infrared wavelengths where heat from the instruments and the sun would just destroy observations. On the right, that's actually a real image, a real photograph, a real image taken at Goddard Space Flight Center on April 24th, 2017. And there you see all those mirror segments were actually put into place over the last um, nine months or so. Now it has to be shipped to Johnson Space Flight Center. It actually just arrived. I got an email like yesterday. But you know what? It had to be driven, and it was actually put on a plane and flown to Texas and landed and then put on another vehicle. And these vehicles are big, and they have to drive, like they have to drive through first just to make sure there's clearance on all the roads. But I don't know. I don't know how much they tell the pilot of this ultimately $8 billion telescope <laughs> of what it's actually they're flying and landing. Um, I don't know about that. So what we're going to do is use the James Webb Space Telescope to look at atmospheres in the way I described. And we're, people are busy trying to find planets, like the Trappist planets and other planets, to follow up. And over at MIT, we have a uh, MIT-led NASA mission that we're working on. It's supposed to launch in March 2018. And the goal of this space telescope is to find planets, find more transiting planets, so we'll have that pool of planets orbiting um, small stars whose atmospheres we can follow up. And I want to make sure I leave time for questions, so I'm just going to speed through some photos. Here's our kind of cardboard model, just to show you how big it is. The whole space telescope, the whole, um, I guess, spacecraft bus, it's not really that big, actually. And inside of it are these four identical cameras. They're essentially glorified telephoto lenses that are very specially made to not have any vignetting, and that temperature doesn't affect them very much. Um, we put our smallest guy with the camera, so it looks as big as it can. <laughs> its um, aperture is really only about 10 centimeters. It has a giant baffle to block out like stray light from the moon or from um, Venus or other planets. And at the bottom, there's a Lincoln Lab, MIT Lincoln Lab made CCD detector. Um, I had some numbers. If you're interested in them, I can share them with you. But here's some real recent pictures. And this is showing you down in uh, Virginia at a place called Orbital STK. They're the ones making the spacecraft bus. And here you see a solar panel that's been mounted. It's our only deployable. And here's an antenna that's going to send data down to Earth. Over here, you see one of the cameras being tested in a, it's not being, uh, it's, the vacuum chamber is open, but it's put in a vacuum chamber to simulate space, and it thermal cycles, and later on gets vibration tested to show that it will perform as we expect in space, because of course you have to build at room temperature, but in space, this camera will be operating at a much colder temperature. Now, um, in this particular telescope, what's cool about it is it's going to observe a very big part of the sky. Um, I did just have some simulated data to show you. Here's showing you one square degree, a small patch of the sky. Like if you put your thumb up like that, that's about one degree. And here's one of the CCD cameras that's actually 12 by 12. So that little one degree patch is here. And now 12 degrees is more like if you outstretched your hand. But each camera will actually have four CCDs. So now we're here, 24 degrees by 24 degrees. And that's um, field of view from one test camera. Remember, there are four cameras. And for those who know something about astronomy, there would be Orion. So now look how many stars we're looking at. So we have a, I wish we had a big, huge data problem on our hands. We don't, though, because we can't downlink all the data all the time. 
we take images, but we have to stack them on board so we can downlink the data um, through the deep space network, that big radio dishes that receive data from NASA missions. Each of these cameras now would be one square, so Orion would fit in one of these squares and it would line up like this. And we'll look at each patch of the sky and we will actually um, tile it, looking at the southern hemisphere in the first year and the northern hemisphere in the second year. So that's kind of where we're at. We have this cool mission there. And for the very last part of my talk, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the future. Because in exoplanets, um, each idea is crazier than the last. And so these transits are only the first part of a very long story, right? It requires um, a fortuitous alignment. The planet's orbit has to be lined up, so the planet is going in front of the star as seen from your telescope. But we're thinking, as far as we can tell, from theory and observation, all stars have different alignments. They're born out of a spherical cloud and they collapse to a disk, so whether they clap this way or this way or this way. And the planets, most of them are in their equatorial plane, but not all of them. And so, yeah, I mean, they're not all gonna be doing that. And so we'd really like to be able to study the very nearest stars whose planets probably aren't transiting. For our Earth, its probability to transit would only be one in 200. So you'd have to look at 200 stars. If all of them had an Earth, you'd see a transiting Earth. So this new one, this new method I wanna end with, we call it Starshade. It's a giant, specially shaped screen. Here it's showing you that it could launch together with a telescope, and it would have these giant petals that would unfurl from a stowed position. And here you see this thing would be tens of meters in diameter, and it would actually have to fly from the telescope tens of thousands of kilometers, and literally line up perfectly to um, block out the starlight so we can see the planets directly. Um, and this idea actually came about in the 1960s by someone named Lyman Spitzer. And through this weird like six degrees of separation thing, my new neighbor is related to him. It was um, his sister's granddaughter. And yeah, so every decade or so, this idea has been revisited because it wasn't feasible in any way before. In fact, what you, um, you can ask me in Q&A if you want to know why it's that shape and everything, because I will run out of time to explain the details to you. But here's one of the petals that would be about seven meters long. And it has this um, very long shape here. I hope they'll bring it back, because I have some more really cool pictures. And here's the Starshade Lab at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where you see they have smaller scale versions. They're working on what you call membrane management how you can fold this thing up and deploy it on. So you can see they've been working on it a long time with a lot of different models. Okay, well, I'm gonna end my talk with more of this um, software. I took another movie clip showing you our Earth and uh, all the stars with known planets around it. And this is gonna start to zoom away from Earth. I wanted you to, you know, to leave you with that thought that there are just so many stars out there uh, with planets. Um, we think we know of thousands of stars with planets now, but honestly, our galaxy has hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of stars. And it's only the really nearby ones, nearest to Earth, who, that we can study, whose atmospheres we can see and who we can really study in detail to find out whether there are signs of life on other worlds. And um, in case any of you wanted to know which part of our galaxy have we observed so far, really only the tiniest part surrounding our own Earth, and some techniques let us go a little further away. So to summarize, um, thousands of planets are known to orbit nearby stars. Most of this information is limited to sizes and orbits and some masses. These Earth-sized planets in the so-called habitable zones of small stars are being detected, like the Trappist ones that I dwelled upon. And then I gave you a little taste about how most of our exciting um, observations remain in the future. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for questions. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk, that was great. Um, my question is about uh, whether you're able to infer the eccentricity of the orbits of these exoplanets, because it strikes me that if you have a highly elliptical orbit, that's far less likely to support life than something that's close to circular. Yes, we can detect eccentricities. It's very hard to do with the method I showed you, because eccentric planets, you know, they'll go slowly, and then when they're closest, they go quickly, and people try to find it based on the um, duration of the transit if it's asymmetric. But there is another method called rate of velocity or the wobble method, and there the planets are orbiting the common center of mass. And we can measure actually the star's line of sight motion, and that technique does let you determine the eccentricity of it. But you know what, it's a good question because we don't have all information for all stars. Not all stars can we make all those observations for, so it's possible that we find another planet and we don't know its eccentricity. 
And so we may not know all the things we want to know to be able to put all the puzzle pieces together. But that said, um, people will always try to find a way to make it happen. So not necessarily measure, but that's fine. It can be eccentric and it can still have the right temperature. Our ocean, as you know, because we live in Boston, right? You know how summer happens well before we get the hottest part of the summer, right? Because our ocean is a giant heat capacitor. So there's a lot of arguments people can make qualitatively and quantitatively about why we're not too worried about eccentricity. Thank you. So I have two questions, might be naive, but one of them is, for a long time, if you watched Earth for the longest time, you wouldn't see any oxygen because there wasn't any. Right? It's only relatively, you know, say the recent half of the history of the planet, there's oxygen. Can you detect the kinds of, of atmospheres you might have in the early part of Earth's? Good question. No, it's a great question. And I'm glad you asked it because I had to gloss over, I glossed over a lot of things. Yes, we've only had oxygen prominent in our atmosphere for about half of our history. And you know what? There's some chance we never would have had it at all because there's a thought that some kind of life makes oxygen, other life uses it, and maybe it should be closer to zero, right? Zero left over. People do. We do everything we can. Earth through time, what did it look like? So we could have seen our Earth, we could have identified its atmosphere with the giant water vapor features, but we might not have been able to see signs of life. Some people think our early Earth was covered with methanogens, methane-producing bacteria. Mm -hmm. Other people have found that, you know what? Ozone is a nonlinear indicator of oxygen. You can have a tiny amount of oxygen and like quite a lot of ozone. So we're doing the best we can. Um, in the ideal world, we just look at the whole spectrum and then, yay, we'd have tons of data. But not sure. So what you're, trying to, what you're not trying to say, but what I'll use that to communicate is that we could have planets where we just won't see signs of life even though it's there. Another quick question, just so we have interesting ecosystems that evolve at the bottom of the, of the ocean where you've got heat coming up from the core. Do we know anything about the cores of these planets? Any way hey, you might try to figure that out? Okay, do we know anything about the cores of these planets? Um, not really, actually. But we do still try to think about it and make models and consider all the possibilities. Uh, but as a little aside to what you're saying, um, no, people do think about this. We try to understand the cores. We've motivated high-pressure physics experiments with these giant gas guns and giant um, other shock experiments that usually they use for, believe it or not, arms control. They usually use it for nuclear studies. So we are actually trying to understand what might be on the inside, but it doesn't lend its way to a lot of observables. Yes. Thanks for uh, speaking with us today. It's a super interesting topic. I'll never look at that, uh, at your office building the same as I walk around Cambridge <laughs> knowing what type of research is happening there. Um, so I, I love the concept of preparing us for this finding. Um, I think that that's really exciting, and it almost feels, you know, the way that you present it as being uh, inevitable, I hope. What type of um, chain reaction would happen in the scientific community, um, really throughout our kind of Earth, uh, when life is discovered? Um, well, I think that question is a tough one, and I think most people here would have their own answer that's different. but. The best way that I see it happening is, first of all, some kind of overhype. Like, if you will Google, you can Google, you know, the TRAPPIST-1 discovery and see what it described. And NASA, I was part of the presentation as like the independent commentator. They did a good job and they made it clear why it was exciting, why we're excited about it. But sort of if you read all the news articles, there's a bit of broken telephone going on, right? So I think that would happen. We see oxygen, yay, this is great, we found life, the aliens are coming. But actually, really, it will take much longer. This is gonna take at least a generation, maybe two or even three. And I like to think back to the whole, um, the Copernican revolution, right? People thought that our Earth was the center of the universe and that everything, the sun, the stars, the planets, everything revolved around Earth. But Copernicus put forth, no, actually, our sun should be the center of the universe. Everything's revolving around the sun. And it took like 400 years before people finally just accepted that as just general knowledge because Newton had to come and make Newtonian mechanics. And then Halley came and predicted Halley's comet would return after 75 years. And I'm not a historian or anything, but so probably people kind of all believed it eventually, but when Halley's Comet returned 75 years later, okay, there, it's a slam dunk. Our sun, everything's orbiting the sun. So I'm not sure what it will be like, actually. I'm not sure if the data will be believable, if we can rule out every scenario that it's not a false positive. So my best guess is we'll find it and there'll be some overhype, then that will die down. And then future generations of telescopes will do a better job in ruling it in or out. And I hope we'll find eventually lots of planets where we see these signs and we can put it all together. Thank you. It's not like the movie um, Arrival. How many, did anyone here see Arrival? I, I liked Arrival. I didn't like the movie so much itself, but I love the concept that the aliens came and they were so different from anything we could imagine. So it's not gonna be obvious like that. <laughs>
Hello. Um, I had a question. You were talking about the amount of data that you collect versus what you can ship down. Can you give us an idea of what that ratio is? And is there any possibility to do processing on the satellite before okay, you yeah. send it down? Well, that's not one first, because that gives us, like, we never want to process on the satellite because we love looking at all the data. And remember when I showed you all those, it's going up, it's going down. Like, we love to know what's happening with all the stars in all the areas of the data. So let's see. Um, with TESS, we're going to be orbiting this highly elliptical orbit, and we're going to zoom by Earth for a few days. And we can download at a rate of almost like 100 um, megabytes per second. But Kepler being at tr you know, millions of miles, hundreds of million miles away, it's a lot less. I don't want to say I know exactly what it is, like 100 or 1,000 kilobits per second. So we're just so limited, right, in the power we have to transmit the data and receive it. So we're always trying to do that better. Now, in terms of total data, I want to say all of the Kepler data, because they're not sending down all the images. They're sending down postage stamps. It might be like on the order of a terabyte. So really, it's not collecting the data and storing it. Sometimes people come up with ways they want to analyze it, like how do you get rid of variable stars, star spots? They want to use something they call Gaussian processes, which is extremely computationally intensive. So we drop that and do something simpler. I don't know if that answers your question, but at least it gave you some more numbers. OK, thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you again for the talk. Uh, uh, if people want to get involved, there's a, uh, a uh, citizen science project called Project Panoptes that I'm involved with, where uh, some folks at, uh, at the uh, Keck Telescope and Subaru uh, in Hawaii are organizing this effort for people to make robotic telescopes that will do a ground-based survey nowhere near as deep as TESS but uh, to find candidates for further yes. uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. There's so many ways to get involved if you want to. If you want to get involved with test data and lend some brain power al algorithms or something else, let me know. Just look me up on the internet and send me an email. You can do this other one. is amazing, but Olivier Guillon, um, an astronomer, in his free time, he's put together a relatively low-cost system. I want to say it's like $1,000 or something. 5000 Oh, my gosh. It's a lot higher than it, I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So you yourself or your you know, children's school or your astronomy club, you can actually get one of these and put it anywhere in your backyard or send it to Hawaii. And he's going to make this website where you can decide what you want to observe or he'll decide for you. And he's done an amazing job with software. Usually we do aperture photometry. We plunk a circle around our object. But because of the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere and instruments, especially wide field ones, that's not really cool. So he's developed a brand new way to do this and do with software processing way better. And he wants, yeah, it's a great thing. I wanted to do this as well, and if I have enough time. Finally, if you wanted to do that, honestly, I'm not even making this up. I know you're all at Google and everything, but the easiest way to get involved is crowdsourcing through planethunters.org. And you can literally just look through light curves and help, in a crowdsourcing fashion, identify drops in the light curve that are due to a planet. That's probably the easiest way, but probably not as sophisticated as most of you can handle. Uh, hi, I have a kind of nitpicky uh, data analysis question, so I apologize for that. When you were describing um, the, how you actually go from the raw data to the process data, it seems to me like naively I would guess the best method to do that would be to pick a, a calibration star and just subtract that from it or something or some average like that as opposed to what you described, which was kind of sounded like making it up. Well, people do a lot of different things, and I certainly did skip a lot of steps. There is a calibration processing that goes on based on what people know about the instrument itself. And that happens before usually people like me and other astronomers see it. But I know what you're saying is that traditionally what we would do is we take um, an average of all non-variant stars that are behaving well, and then we just sort of subtract out. But the thing is, the detector is so big here. And things happening on one part of the detector are not necessarily exactly what's happening on the other part of the de detector. So that sort of averaging isn't typically used in this regard. But it is a good question, and there are lots of ways people are doing it, and I certainly didn't do it justice. Can I go again? Sure. Yeah, we have 36 seconds. <laughs> uh, the one that you were talking about at the very end with the shade that would block the... Star shade, yeah. The, that seems like it would only work in really specific circumstances, like you could set it up to look at one star, Yes. and that's it? Star shade itself, the star shade has a spacecraft attached to it. It has to line up with the telescope, and so it actually has to move across the sky for each one. And so when we think about star shade and what it can do, it has a certain number of retargets. So it can move around a certain number of times, which may be on the order of 100 or 300 times. And so you need to choose wisely how you're going to move across the sky and which targets you're going to look at. Yes. OK, well, we're out of time. And I just want to thank you for coming to my talk.